Episode 181. <clears throat> Warning, this show contains adult language, so viewer and listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another edition of Up and Edit. I'm your host, Adrian Babishoff. And if you're new here, welcome as well. And if you're wondering what the show is about, it's entirely dedicated to improving quality of life for both people and planet through liberation and independence, moving you from surviving to thriving and living life raw. Today's episode 181, I want to talk about aphids in the garden. Uh, before I get there, though, um, I am really enjoying doing this show, and I think I want to try to do a little bit extra for you guys, but I need something in return because my budget doesn't allow me to do such long shows, and I keep finding myself trying to force speak everything I can within 15 minutes segments, and I really don't like doing that. I really want to do the, a lot of research, and I want to bring you guys more quality and more, uh, yeah, I just want to bring you guys more stuff here. So I'm thinking, if I had this thought, and this is the experiment on today's show, is uh, I'm going to go a little more extensively than I usually do. And the thought is, is to keep up the regular free, and it will remain free for the rest of uh, the lifetime of the show until I uh, get bored of doing it or what. But I, I work for free right now, right? And I give this stuff for free. But I was thinking of going a little bit extra and actually giving some footage to a members only area where people could pay say $5 a month or $50 a year for a membership and be able to get exclusive, uh, more in detail, hard course uh, information. So I'm going to practice run on this show today. Uh, what I want to talk about aphids, let's get into it. And I think that we need to worry about this uh, a lot because if you're depending a lot on the food to, for sustenance to feed your family, it's things like aphids, like I'm experiencing right now, which is the end of March here in 2021. And I got a complete aphid infestation in my garden. Uh, I've been using a, uh, a microscope to study these guys, a, a high-powered mag magnifying glass, uh, reading a lot, trying to figure out what are the characteristics, how do these things function, what are their breeding habits, feeding habits, and, and trying experimental stuff, which I have had great success doing. Uh, which I've heard nobody else, uh, nobody else is using these, these tactics. Uh, one in particular, which I want to share with you guys here today. Um, that's the kind of information that would be in the extra segment area. And this, basically, to get back to that, it would afford me to be able to pay um, a lot more money to be able to produce these uh, shows for you guys. And maybe we can go a little bit bigger. Uh, and what I hope is that maybe if I turn this into like a side hustle, I'd be able to actually spend... Uh, more time and bring you guys like just really viscid, thick, informational uh, shows. So, yeah, let's get back into it though. So, starting off, um, there's like 4,000 different species of aphids. And uh, these guys, there's a lot of talk. I think people who garden or people like to teach gardening, it's really all up, all over the place. There's no one, one cure-all. There's the whole thing I think we've talked about where it's the, the green thumb myth. Uh, just because somebody else is doing something that has great success, like even a neighbor across the street or right next to your house, doesn't mean if you copied verbatim what they did that you'd get the same results. And maybe that's the problem, is people are looking at, well, everybody's saying that we, we I should do this stuff, but it's just not working. There's something wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's just that maybe the aphids, you've got a different breed of aphids that may look similar, and you have a different biome. For instance, I want to share with you guys with the aphids is uh, uh, when there's warmer temperatures, supposedly, and this goes with white fly, which uh, is a, a, in the same family as aphids, but once they get a, the right type of temperatures, they can actually proliferate a lot better. So for instance, for me right now, I'm growing my food in a, uh, a sort of greenhouse. It's not completely covered, uh, but it's got uh, two side walls. The other walls are open so that the bees and little tiny birds and other insects could come in like ladybugs and things like that, beneficial insects. And it lets the wind blow because if you don't have wind blowing on your plants, they get kind of leggy and weak, and that's something we don't want. So, yeah, but because I, I have these this shelter basically over my plants, it's also sheltering the aphids. And I've had through winter where it's freezing conditions like cold, frost, uh, ice on, the, uh, on water puddles, and they're living just fine inside my little greenhouse because it's a few degrees warmer. So your, your home could be a little bit warmer if you had to say a brick wall or something where the sun was shining and that's where your vegetable patch was, you know, especially those living in the, in the compact city, you know, dense city style. Um, that brick wall is radiating heat 
and keeping that area warm at nighttime using thermal uh, uh, inertia, you know, therm thermal uh, mass. It's, it's, it's holding onto it. If you uh, guys ever experienced this, go down, you know, at the end of the night, uh, go down to the north side of your, your, your house where this, or wherever you're at in the world where the sun doesn't shine. Feel this stucco on your wall or the rocks around you. They're going to be cold. The ones that were sitting in the sunlight will actually will be warm. There'll be a huge difference. You don't need any special devices to measure it. You can just do it with your hands by feel. So yeah, a lot of things could be are, are, are things to take in consideration. Uh, but these aphids, they are relentless. They will ruin your crops. And I, I was just about ready to give up before I uh, uh, invented something new here, a new, a new way of getting rid of them. And it's all natural and organic. So yeah, we got 4,000 species, guys. And they are, uh, <laughs> these guys, show, I've got three different species on my farm right now. Um, so they eggs, the, uh, they'll lay eggs uh, to overwinter when it gets too cold and when they're exposed to the weather. To finish up on that, uh, what I was telling you about my greenhouse, if it was exposed, I think we'd have a lot less uh, problems with the green, with, with the aphids. Not, not no problems, we'd have a lot less because it'd be a lot colder. Uh, so yeah, they'll, they'll um, lay eggs to overwinter to, for their species to, to survive. And uh, these little rascals, they, uh, they give live birth to nymphs. And they don't need, and what's crazy is that these aphids, they're all females, right? So they basically clone themselves. And I mean, these guys start breeding very, very quick. And so while they're feeding, uh, they don't need males to mate. They will actually start uh, uh, giving birth to live nymphs, live babies, and, and lots of them. And uh, they're all females. And once they... Once they go and they, they actually infest a plant and the, they, they create their colonies and they start to uh, uh, bleed out and eat everything they can and, the, and they, they know that the plant's going to die, they will actually go and mate with, uh, they'll actually give birth to uh, themselves. This is amazing. So these are like really screwed up insects and like really mess with our, our systems there, I mean, but they're very fascinating at the same time. They'll actually switch gears and stop producing females and start producing males so that they can mate with them. That way they can uh, uh, produce winged uh, uh, species of their own. They'll change their form. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> as much as I hate them, I'm amazed. So they'll actually change their form so that they can fly and uh, go colonize other plants. Now their flying patterns aren't very good. They have a, a very lacy, light, lightweight wings. Uh, they don't really fly too far. They have to depend more on the wind and kind of for directions, but these guys are smart. They know where to land, and uh, you know they basically float around in the wind if there's high winds, and that's how they can uh, travel a lot further distance. But if they didn't have the wind, they can't really fly that far. But in your garden, what they'll do is they'll go and they'll fly around and they'll actually taste test your plants, and they'll find one that's suitable. And then they'll go, and these are winged females, by the way. They just mate with the males, and then they're done with them, right? The males die off, and then they don't breed anymore, so. Make sure, uh, my friends and family out there, my, my brotherhood of, uh, of males, make sure that uh, human females don't get this, uh, uh, you know, this, the gist of this because we might be out of here. You know, maybe they'll stop breeding us. <laughs> uh, they got a different memo in the gene pool. So yeah, they'll fly over to the next plant and that's how they, they assure their survival. And again, they'll turn all the females and they'll start feeding immediately on the right type of plant. So let's pause here for a second. And I think the rules of nature is that a lot of insects attack weaker plants. Plants have an intelligence as well in the, uh, uh, encoded inside them. So some plants who are very healthy and have a healthy immune system like human beings will be able to deter these things. That's the reason why it is said scientifically that these aphids will fly from one plant, kind of taste it. Uh, again, this is not from, from my mouth. This is from the information on, uh, from uh, scientists and things like that. They may taste the plant and go, oh, geez, that's uh, giving off some, some crazy flavors and stuff. It doesn't, it, it's too strong for us. Let's go find something that's weaker. So, the physical makeup. Let's move forward on these aphids. These aphids are soft-bodied, uh, meaning their body doesn't really have a hard crustacean over it. It doesn't really have a hard surface. So they're very, very uh, vulnerable uh, to the weather and to like us rubbing them, you know, another plant rubbing them. That's why they'll go and hide under uh, leaves and stuff to, from predators and things like that because they're very soft shell, very soft bodied, uh, not very much armor like say uh, uh, like 
pincher bugs, you know, or uh, um, you know, earwigs or or uh, snails, of course, or uh, cockroaches and things like that. They're they're very soft, soft body, and they're very delicate. <coughs> Yeah, and their physical makeup as well, they have a long beak that comes out kind of like a mosquito. And it is said, and this makes sense to me, especially observing them in a high-powered magnifying glass, that once they attach themselves, they find like a feeding, they, they find a plant that they like, they'll actually penetrate this needle, that's their mouth. They don't have teeth. I heard some people say that they, they start eating. No, they don't have teeth. They, they, they suck like a vampire, like a mosquito, basically. But once they're attached, and if they're soft-bodied uh, and, and they get blown too hard by wind or by a, a, a jet stream of water, which we're going to talk about, it may rip that, that beak off of them. And, and, I, and to my knowledge, I don't think that they can reproduce another. They're, you know, they, can, they can clone themselves, but I don't know if they can clone a new fucking beak. They may. Who knows? You know? <laughs> we'll have to catch one captive and hold them down and put him in questioning. You know, where were you uh, on the night of cloning? You know? Uh, so yeah, that's their feeding characteristics, and um, they also are there. They when they they eat the food, they they go after like a lot of sugars that are, are produced from the plants through photosynthesis. Uh, they produce so much sugar in their bodies, they have to actually excrete it out because it doesn't uh, uh, go well with the digestion of their their systems. So what they do is they poop out basically honeydew. It's called it's like a sugar sap water. Well, guess who likes sugar? Ants. Ants like to come and they'll grab this sugar water and they'll actually eat on it. They'll take it back and it's a big advantage to ant colonies. This is kind of why I don't like in-ground gardening. Unless you have time to uh, you know, mess around with these things. I don't have time. I'm a business owner and entrepreneur, and I, but I do want to grow my own food security. and I want to do it with the least amount of effort. So that's why I choose to suspend my gardens up in the air and use such tactics, which I don't have time to share today. But yeah, these ants will literally come in and they will protect the aphids. Um, this is a crazy symbiotic relationship. Uh, ants will actually defend these, these uh, aphids. It's also said that they will actually uh, uh, corral these things like we do with cows, right, and sheep. They'll actually herd aphids. They'll take them back. Uh, I, think, I, I think I heard somewhere, if memory serves me correctly, and they'll actually store them in their nests, like in the ant nests in the colonies and, and uh, farm them, raise them, just like animals. So it's a symbiotic relationship where they'll, they'll move these uh, uh, aphids around and keep, uh, keep uh, 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 eating all the excretions that they get of the honeydew and also protect them. And it's just, it's fascinating. So what is plant reactions uh, to being attacked by aphids? You will literally see leaves starting to curl. You may see them start to brown, like dry up. You'll see them start to turn kind of yellowish. Um, you need to look underneath. They're not just underneath you. They're on the stems. They'll go all over the place, at least in my experience. Again, that my, my biome, my environment might be different from where you're at, especially as list, uh, you listeners all uh, you know, from other parts of the, the world, not just the country. But yeah, they're, the plant, you'll start to see the leaf curl up. Uh, I've had this problem right now is one of my big things I've been trying to work on is, is my baby seedlings. So when you have a large plant, you're going to have, say, like a spinach, or mine right now is an arugula. An arugula is a nice flat leaf with just barely a little bit of curl on the tips. What I noticed is mine actually curled really hard in half. And what's happening is, uh, is the plant's trying to uh, uh, protect itself. And, and, but what happens is symbiotically, or not symbiotically, but what the aphids get out of this is actually a little cave, a little home. I'm actually experiencing this right now in my spinach. The spinach is already naturally curled. So the aphids are all underneath there and they're completely protected and hidden, even from us. So for you to go in there and spray and be able to rub them and take care of them, you have to uncurl that plant and chances will be that you will actually crack the leaf and, uh, and damage the plant. Well, so you got the, the aphids attacking your, your arugula, let's say, or your spinach, and then you come in to try to rub them off or get them out of there and then you crack the leaf. So the plant's just basically being attacked by, by uh, all sides and it's very difficult to get these under control. But that's basically what you will see in a lot of your plants. Uh, my seedlings is my biggest problem because seedlings uh, are very small and they have very delicate leaves and they have the very first water leaves that come out. And I noticed that the aphids were on those and those were already curling up. So in order for me to go and try to open that leaf to spray it with some, say, neem oil or even rub them with my fingers, 
by the time I'd opened that up, I ripped the ceiling out of the ground. Uh, you know, you twitch just a little bit. So it's very, very difficult. But that's how you'll, you'll basically see them is look for leaf curl and yellowing and browning and things like that. But I advise that you go through your plants uh, vigorously a lot. Go check your plants at least once a week. I would say best, if you ask me, I would say twice a week. Go in and really open up, all, look on the bottom side of your leaves of everything. Bell peppers, jalapenos, they desecrated my jalapenos last year. I got, I got some pretty good harvest, but there was a lot of plants that they just completely destroyed. Uh, so get in there and really, really take a good look. Um, uh, a way before I move into the next one, because I don't have this on my, uh, my list here, is that, see, we're already at 15 minutes. Okay, so this would be, well, let, let me give you guys this last uh, uh, advice here as far as combating aphids. You want to plant uh, about triple, double to triple the amount of plants that you think that you'll need, because we don't have just aphids, people. We've got all kinds of stuff that's going to come and destroy your garden. The problem is, is you have some stuff that's seasonal, Say like a tomato takes like 90 days. Aphids don't really attack tomatoes, but you know, uh, radishes and things like that, they do cabbages. So what happens, you only have a certain amount of growing time, right? Where the weather's, let's say cabbage is, is, is a cool weather crop. If they destroy it like four weeks in, you gotta start plant, replanting while you're four weeks behind. It may happen to where by the time you replace that plant that the aphids killed, um, summertime, you know, fall or I'm sorry, spring comes and the weather starts to warm up. Then your your uh, your cabbage starts to bolt because it's not designed to be in the hot weather. If you get yourself some residual plants and always keep those as a backup, you know, seeds are cheap and uh, growing seedlings is not really that hard. Um, again, you're going to want to protect them from aphids. There's so, there's so much that we need to share in here, but get yourself some backup plants that you can replace those things immediately. So. Now, this would be the part of the podcast where we ran our 15 minutes. We're actually on 16, 17 minutes and counting. This would be the part where I'd say, hey, this has been a great show. Uh, this is it. Uh, for further information, consider becoming a member and getting premium uh, um, information from the show, premium access, and go to the website, which would probably be up and in it, uh, upandinit.com, and you would pay $5 a month, and that gives you 20 episodes for $5, really. I think that would be uh, uh, worth the money. That's not much at all if you think about it. Probably about 15 cents an episode. Uh, but this is where you would go, and you, we'd do some free, further uh, in-depth uh, conversations about this. But, but for this today, and hopefully for the rest of this week, I'm going to do this experiment and try to keep going for you guys and give you some longer stuff and spend the money um, to see if you if you guys like this sort of thing. So let's keep moving on now. We want to move into control of uh, aphids. Um, so control of aphids, there's a couple different things. There's the first one, uh, the most simplest, we'll start with the basic and work our way up, is rubbing the uh, aphids with your fingers. So as I said with the leaves, you want to pick up your, the leaves of your plants and where you see uh, even one or two, just give them a slight light rub with your thumb or your index finger. Now it's very gooey and yucky stuff, but to me, I mean, hey, that's nature. You can put rubber gloves on if you want. If you're a sissy, you know, if you can't handle it, <laughs> I'm just kidding. If it grosses you out, use rubber gloves. Just please recycle them or something. I don't know. Our earth needs help, guys. But if you're going to go in there, you just want to rub them very gently. You don't need to smash the plant. As I said, they're very soft bodied. This can work for a very small garden. Uh, but if you've got such things as seedlings, uh, I don't think it's really going to work out for you. We need to move on to some spray. So let's move on to spray. And, and if you're very busy like me, you need to figure out something else too. We can't be sitting there rubbing those, those plants. We need to get on with our lives. We need to get uh, making some money and stuff so we can afford to oh, keep the land payments where we have our garden. So the next one's going to be water blasting. And a lot, all these I'm going to give you is non-chemical. I do not use chemicals, so don't expect to ever get anything like that from me uh, on this show. We do not endorse chemicals at all. Everything's natural or we don't do it at all. So water blasting, uh, these guys, as I said, have their beak stuck inside the uh, plant. So they're kind of anchored. So that's kind of what you want to uh, 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 do is get a, uh, either in a water bottle and get it to like a, a fine mist because you don't want to blast, especially seedlings. Their, their leaves are very delicate as well. You'll notice that they'll turn dark green, like a bruise. So if you're spraying your plants too hard, uh, you'll actually see like, like little dots and streaks, like a, 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 basically a bruise in the leaves. So you want to get like a very fine mist, but you want to get it to where it's got some high pressure on it. 
So you're going to lift up your leaves and you're going to get maybe your squeezy water bottle and you're going to like point blank these guys, you know what I mean? Right like get to the head. You're going down, motherfucker, you know, gangster style, you know, taking, not even taking names, you know, taking names later. But you get in there and, and uh, blast these guys really close and you'll rip off their beaks. Uh, you may even, as the plants, as I said, where it bruises them, I think that you'll bruise their body. It's my uh, philosophy on it, my, my uh, hypothesis, that you'll actually cause damage to their body. So when you spray them, you're going to knock them off. It's going to rip out their beak. If they're winged one, it's going to damage their wings so they can't fly over to another plant. It's going to bruise their body. They're going to fall down on the ground, and they move very slowly, it is said. I've noticed some, they don't move that slow. They can actually crawl. It reminds me of like the speed of like a turtle. Uh, but they can they can move, but they'll you're gonna knock them to the ground, and uh, it is said that they don't have the energy to climb back up and get onto the plant and reestablish themselves. So you're just knocking them off the plant. Uh, you can do this with a uh, air with a, uh, a water hose as well. That's what I use. I put it on like a uh, a uh, mister uh, or a, a fan, and you can kind of keep a distance away from like grown plants is like spinach and stuff. Who's got established arugula, beets? They got the tough skin. You don't have to really get point blank. You can just keep rinsing them. Uh, to finish with the rinsing too is make sure that you're watching everything, man. You want to really get in there. And I mean, these guys are in the in the crotches, like the uh, the elbows of the plants where the crooks happen. So get in there, really soak these guys down, really jet stream everything. Because the more you get out, the better. Because you leave just one, they're going to start proliferating. They're going to start laying their nymphs again, right? So that's why this method is is good to kind of keep them under control but i don't believe that you're going to get all of them okay moving forward um water blast the next one is soapy spray right and i want you guys to uh you might need to write all this stuff down maybe you need to listen to the show again if you're really concerned about aphids but you want to get one tablespoon of water per quart uh well i'm sorry one table one tablespoon of soap per quart of water now this is going to be on you guys to go and use like uh, Dawn dish detergent stuff that, you know, chemical uh, soaps. I don't really know how your plants are going to react with that. Um, let's kind of talk about that for a second. Your plants actually breathe. Trees, all anything with leaves, actually that's their lungs, right? They, they convert carbon dioxide to oxygen, but they have like lungs, these little holes underneath, and that's where they actually suck in nutrients and actually suck in the carbon uh, carbon uh, uh, dioxide um, and, and that th there's a lot going on there so when you're spraying it with anything these plants are literally ingesting some of it so that's why we want to use something like maybe a Dr. Bronner soap I use a baby uh, uh, hemp soap uh, and there's no animal testing on Dr. Bronner supposedly so it's a very gentle and very environmentally friendly biodegradable soap so I would recommend that you guys use something like that, but it's, uh, and I, I don't think I've, I've done, I've used this stuff, so I have experience and it doesn't really harm the plants. But basically what this does is this is going to go onto the aphids and it's actually going to dehydrate their skin, right? Uh, and it's going it, to, it'll kill them. Uh, I had to do a certain amount of uh, experimentation where I believe I doubled it. I did two tablespoons of Dr. Bronner soap to one quart of water. Uh, to make this simple for you guys too, it would be four tablespoons you want to start out with per gallon if you're going to mix it in big batches. And uh, so I'm going to give you guys one of my secret things that I actually just found out yesterday. I did an experiment and basically what it was is to double up that soap. And what you're going to do is you're going to go to your plants and uh, you're going to spray them where you have the aphids and it's going to really like leave suds on the plants, right? Well, you're going to suds this whole thing out. You're going to leave it for about five minutes and then you're going to go with your spray bottle or your, your watering wand would be the fastest. And you're going to want to go and mist the plant and you want to wash the soap off as, as quickly as possible. What I did is I took a leaf and I cut it out. I'm giving you guys some, uh, one of my biggest secrets. I mean, this is stuff I'm going to put in my garden book uh, that I'm writing. Uh, I took a leaf that was completely infested with them, sprayed it with this soap, got myself a high-powered uh, magnifying glass, and I left this thing in a bowl in the shade, the leaf with the, with the aphids all over it. And I timed it. I figured, well, it's probably I'll, I'll come check every 20, 30 minutes. I came back within 5, 10 minutes and uh, grabbed the, the uh, magnifying glass and looked, and all the aphids were dead. How did I know they were dead? I had myself a toothpick. And before I sprayed them, I kind of nudged them a little bit, just kind of moved them. You can see their little legs moving around. When I sprayed them with the soap, 
and put them under the light. You can see their legs were just completely still. These things were, they were massacred. They were gone. Con la patas para arriba, as they say in Spanish. So, but this soap is definitely going to start messing with your plants. So it's very important that you spray your plants with this and then rinse it as soon as possible. I would advise that you guys get a magnifying glass and make sure that these guys are dead before you rinse your plants off as well. And when you are spraying, in contrast to rubbing with your fingers, what you want to do is you want to open up, at least uh, uh, partially open up those leaves. Remember we were talking about how they're, they're all curled up? Well, all you need to do is flip that leaf upside down and saturate it with some of this soapy water. So now you don't need to rub with your fingers or anything like that. That soap's going to take care of it for you. So this is one of the cheapest, uh, most environmentally friendliest ways that I know of that you can take care of them. But you want to make sure if you have plants that are large and they're standing up that you really get in there. That's when a bug sprayer with a wand comes in handy. You want to spray from the top, get that all saturated. Make sure you get every crook and nanny from the, the, the cranny from the top. Then you need to do this from the bottom. Now if you've got big giant bushy ones, you've got to kind of get in layers and just kind of go through. It's like, a, imagine like a pine tree. You're going to squirt from the bottom up, but the, the, those leaves are going to stop it from getting to the next set. You need to go from each layer and really saturate this thing. And very important when you're done to saturate it with the water as well. All right, that was a, this is a very powerful one for you guys. And this is sa my saving grace. Now, um, as a Directin, I think is a missing, is missing from processed neem oil. Uh, this is what uh, they spray on plants in nurseries. As a Directin. Yeah, this is this is what's. I'm sorry. As a direct, this is a, a chemical a, that's that's natural in neem oil. Neem oil is also natural. I heard some people even ingest it. They eat it for uh, actually for the coronavirus. I heard in India. But um, as a direct, and if I'm pronouncing it right, is one of the natural forming chemicals that happens in neem oil, which is a neem tree, which is only grown in subtropics, I believe, and it's the seeds. And you want to get neem oil that was cold pressed uh, when it's processed. Uh, this as a direct and stuff kind of gets out of the plant and it's no longer as good now neem oil is actually a poison to uh, aphids uh, It'll coat and it's very oily uh, If you're gonna mix this stuff with water, let's get into that. You're gonna want to mix. Uh, what are we looking at? Neem we're gonna do one to two tablespoons per gallon of water, right? So that means that you want to do a half a tablespoon per quart of water for using those little squeezy bottles. But let's, but wait here, we're not done. We need to act, uh, add some soap to that neem oil because water and oil don't mix. When you put the soap in there, the soap actually breaks down the oil a bit and causes what they call an emulsified uh, um, uh, body. So meaning that it's actually mixing with the water uh, and, the, and the oil and the soap actually binds it all kind of together. But regardless, when you're spraying, whether you're using a bug sprayer or a hand sprayer, you're going to want to use, uh, you're going to want to shake this thing up uh, very often uh, before each spray. So I would say spray for about maybe 30 seconds, a minute, stop, shake up your bottle, your, 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 your bug bottle, whatever you've got there, uh, before you're, if you're spraying with a wand or uh, if you're spraying by, by a pump. Okay. Um, one of the things I did an experiment too with is uh, I actually looked online and this is the kind of thinking that I want you guys to get into is experimenting with stuff that's never been uh, done before. I, I came up with the idea that, you know what, I've never seen aphids on tomato plants and whenever I brush up against a tomato plant, it gives off this crazy aroma. You know, this is this defense mechanism, I think, like it'll, uh, it knows it's being attacked. So what I did is uh, I went and YouTubed it, of course, to see what other people were saying if they actually used this stuff. And I, I'm not sure if I didn't make it uh, enough concentration or what, but basically what I did is made a tomato leaf tea and to mask the scent of say arugula or cabbage or something, I sprayed my plants with just basically uh, tomato tea, tomato leaf tea. Uh, did it kill them? Some said it would. I sprayed them. It did not kill them. Uh, they were just fine. Uh, I think that the smell might irritate them, but that didn't really work. I did, did it for, tried it about two times a spring, and again, came back to see what the, uh, the uh, outcome was, and it wasn't really much at all. Again, I didn't try it on a lot thicker, viscid scale, a lot more potency, but it's something worth to try again. But uh, as far as what they're saying online, I'm going to call that one no. Uh, peppermint oil is another one that people are using. 
Uh, there's a Dr. Bronner soap that actually has peppermint oil in it already. Uh, it's, we get, uh, I think I've seen it at Costco. Uh, but I went and bought myself an essential oil, uh, large, about maybe like 12 ounces of, uh, of peppermint oil to use. Uh, because I figured we'd be using this a lot. Um, I could use it around my house as well. But what we had is that the uh, peppermint oil, you want to do uh, one to two teaspoons per gallon. Now, you got to be very careful with these sort of things. The uh, gist of this is that people are hoping that the, the aroma of the peppermint is going to agitate. They don't claim that it's going to kill, although some said it would kill. It does not kill uh, uh, aphids. I'm here to tell you that right now. Uh, I, I mixed it up and it actually, when I was spraying it in my garden, my, I could feel my eyes getting a little steamy, you know, from the, the, uh, the menthol, the, the peppermint oil stuff. And uh, yeah, it definitely got me. But now pep, it doesn't really work as well as what people say. I'm going to continue to experiment with it, but I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. Now let's get into predators. Uh, there's a lot of predators out there. Uh, you can Google, we don't have time to go into every single one of them, but let's go into one uh, which is called the green lace, uh, lace wing. Uh, this one it looks like it's like a torpedo kind of shape. Uh, it's got some long, it looks like a triangular, kind of like a jet. It's got long clear leaves, uh, leaves, long clear wings, uh, and they're like green, light lime green in color. And these guys will come in, and I think it's very important for you guys to identify these type of insects so that you don't spray them and kill them. So let's Let's just pause right now before we get on to the predators. When you start spraying your plants with soap, uh, anything other than water, let's just, let's just cut it short. You know, neem oil, soaps, and all that, you're going to harm the beneficial uh, insects as well. You're ki with like neem oil, yes, it's natural, and a lot of people don't say this, but you're actually killing everything. It's like when you take, atom, uh, I call them atom bomb biotics, uh, antibiotics. You know, it goes in and kills all the good bacteria and the bad bacteria and everything in your body. It just takes you down to square zero, you know, like dropping an atom bomb on a land. It just annihilates everything. So that's not something I think that you'd want to do. Um, okay, let's get here. Uh, actually, I'm at my job and we can shut this motor off and get you guys some better sound quality. Sorry about that, too. That's the background noise for me and my uh, work commute. Uh, but let's get on it here. So lace wings, yes, they will come in and they will start massacring these, these aphids. Uh, soft body skin, they'll, get, they'll even start eating the nymphs and the eggs, I believe, and everything. Uh, you get ladybugs that will come in. These will also, if you guys aren't familiar, it's a little red, black, and, uh, black uh, head, a red uh, wings, like a red bulbous uh, uh, body with black dots on it. Some of them are yellow uh, and there's, all, there's different variations, but these ladybugs will definitely feast on them. And here's a note that I want to tell you guys is when you are gardening, like for instance, for me right now, uh, we're moving into spring. I think it's, I'm not sure. I don't know why I never, I don't follow these things, but I think we're in spring right now, the very beginnings. Uh, but everything's starting to blossom, right? And this means uh, not just your, your, your garden, but every, the weeds and stuff around you. Now, if you go in tall grasses and right about this time of year, the beginning of spring, you're going to start seeing these ladybugs. Uh, they're the most easiest to identify and find because they have the bright red. And just gently with your hands, start opening up the thickets of, of grasses and weeds and stuff. And you're going to start to notice that uh, when they appear. Uh, lace wings, I think, and all of them, all these predators are going to start to appear during the, the springtime when the, when the weather, when, they, when the heat comes and it's just the right temperature. So as we say in permaculture and natural farming and everything, is we want to utilize these guys. Why would we want to kill them? And what we also want to consider is building habitat for them. Uh, habitat for um, ladybugs is pollen uh, and also places where there's aphids, right? Uh, nature balances itself out. Whenever there's a problem, the solution will present itself. There's a, it's a big circle, you know, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. So when the aphids become into abundance, uh, all these insects will show up and they'll start eating it. But they also need a place to actually be. So here's a problem, you know, to, to survive for them, themselves as well. You know, you build your wonderful garden and you mow all the weeds and everything around you. Uh, they probably will show up. And here's the problem. Here's where people go and buy like a bottle of, of aphids, right? Or lace wings and, you know, things like that. Uh, uh, another one is, uh, which I don't have in my notes here, is the uh, um, praying mantis, right? You get them and you release them and they, some of them will just fly away, right? Uh, but some of them will look and they'll go, oh, there's aphids. I'm going to, you know, mom, 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 mom. Uh, you know, it's like a smorgasbord for them. Well, what happens when they eat all the aphids? 
Well, then they move on to find other aphids, right? Or pollen. So, and they need a place to hide from predators that want to eat them, such as other birds and things like that. So you want to consider leaving a portion natural of your yard of a bunch of weeds. If you don't like weeds, plant like a bunch of perennial, which means things that just keep constantly going. They don't just grow once and then die and you have to replant them. Get something with thick bush in it, it's places where these animals could hide. And also consider growing stuff in your garden also. not just Don't just grow food for you, grow food for them as well. Certain things like uh, that, that serve a purpose, like marigolds. Uh, the regular old common marigold will attract bees and I believe uh, these ladybugs and, and uh, you know, other bumblebees and things like that and wasps. Uh, but uh, they don't really serve a purpose for you. And we like to stack functions on the show, right? So what, you're, what I'd like for you guys to consider to do is grow edible marigolds, such as lemon gem or tangerine gem. And what these things are going to do is they're going to attract those bees and ladybugs and give them food to eat. Um, and also attract the bees so the bees will pollinate your, your garden for you. You see how this all works together. But now you're able to take these flowers and pick them yourself too and put them in salads or spring rolls and things like that. So I prefer like nasturtiums, uh, edible, wild, uh, edible flowers and things like that to disperse within your garden. Uh, I forgot to say as well as it is said that marigolds will actually give off a scent both in the air for aphids uh, and, and, and uh, uh, I believe white fly, but, but for predatory uh, uh, insects that come to eat your garden, it actually releases a smell that they don't like. So it actually protects it and makes it look beautiful. But I hear it, marigolds will also do this in the ground for like gophers and things like that. So there's a lot of components to it. I think that we should be concerned about feeding ourselves uh, and, and that's not necessarily just ourselves, but also give some back to nature so that nature can help us out as well. Cause we want, we want part of the symbiotic relationship, right? Um, so before I move forward to, uh, we have to wait for the ladybugs to show up. And this is why it's very important. I mean, they will, they'll pick the bones clean on your, your, these, these aphids of your plants, right? From, from eating your plants. Uh, but you want to, you're going to want to use water blasting. You may want to use soap and neem oil and everything during the winter if you experience uh, this sort of problem like I have. But you want to also keep a close eye out on the fields and watch for those ladybugs. And once you see those ladybugs coming, cease to use your neem oil, your soap, even water blasting and things like that. Just stop using it all together. Uh, wait till there's abundance of these, these insects there and let them start to figure out where these aphids are on your garden. Because guess what? The aphids are not necessarily in those weeds. They're all over there on your, your garden. And these, the, the, the predatory uh, insects that like to eat these guys, they can sniff them out, right? They're like wolves. So if you leave it alone, they will show up uh, and they will start to eat everything. But in the meantime, when they're not around to do that work for you, go ahead and feel free to use the sprays. So hoverflies is another one. And this is kind of off the top. I guess these guys uh, like eating aphids too. Uh, but they, they're those little flies that fly like, like, like they just kind of float in one area, it seems like, right? I did some research on these guys because I got one of those bug assault guns, you know, uh, it shoots a little, uh, it's like a, a little salt shaker shotgun. And I got a, a tons of flies around me all the time when on my days off. So I'd use that to shoot them, the flies off my feet and off my table. I mean, uh, and I see those hover flies and uh, I kept looking going, they don't look like regular flies. Why are they hovering there? Um, so I did some research. I actually shot one with the salt, unfortunately. Uh, and I grabbed it under a, a uh, not a microscope, but a magnifying glass and looked at it. And sure enough, it has a pointy little butt. It, doesn't, it almost looks like a half of a, of a, a bee and half of a, a, a fly. So one thing I found out about these hoverflies is that they actually don't bother human beings. And they actually don't eat garbage. They actually eat uh, insects and they actually eat pollen. So they actually are pollinators. So when you see those flies, those irritating ones kind of hovering around, just walk through them. They're not going to land on your food or go in your drink or anything. They're actually beneficial insects from the extent of my knowledge so far. Uh, but as I said, they will eat the aphids as well. So a lot of things to take in consideration and a lot of respect we need to give for nature. Uh, birds is another one I noticed. Uh, chickens will do the same. Unfortunately, if you let chickens in your garden, they'll eat your plants as well. Uh, so I don't think this is a good one, but in my greenhouse, I have chicken wire, which is like a, a one inch diameter. So I have these little tiny birds that will come and they'll actually hang upside down off my pepper plants and things like that. And they'll actually feast off of the uh, aphids as well. Uh, the only problem I don't like is they're probably going to eat my ladybugs and my praying mantises and stuff like that. So give or take. Um, so that's, that's it there. The last note here is just bad years, right? 
I got two for you. Uh, there's just certain years. I've never seen a year like this where we had these guys, these these aphids come in. Like I said, I've got black aphids. Uh, I don't know the species. I do one I think is a peach aphid. It's the light green ones. And I have some that are like kind of a whitish color. So I got three of them showing up. And I also have white fly coming to the party. Last year, I didn't nearly have this amount of, of uh, infestation. So there's certain years that their numbers will grow. Will be, it, it's the way nature does, right? Give you guys an example, like uh, oak trees will actually, uh, you know, they drop their acorns. And you'll be walking at the park or in the forest, and you'll notice, like, there's some acorns laying around. Well, every three, four, five years or so, these, these um, it's a survival tactic. These uh, um, oak trees have a sense. They know that this is going to be abundance of rain. So what do they do? They held that energy in for a few years. And when they know that good year's coming, they completely inundate the whole entire hillside uh, with uh, they inundate the whole entire hillside with uh, uh, seeds. So that's those years where you'll be walking. There'll be like six inches of just acorns everywhere, right? Just everywhere. They they do so many seeds that the squirrels and and everything can't really get to all of them. And this ensures their survival so that they can. Uh, uh, This ensures their survival so that their babies can be born. So this is the same thing I believe that happens in a, in a lot of the natural kingdoms. You guys will notice this in mice. Uh, if you know if you guys seen any videos where people are, will drive over and they'll just show like this, like hundreds of mice, just like scout, like thousands of them. There's just certain years that they know that their things are going to be good. And these are signs as well that you can look at. Normally <clears throat> when you look at what the oak was doing or, uh, I'd say the mice or aphid infestation here is, is, I think, is that they know better than we can that there's going to be a very good year possibly, right? These are signs that they're looking going, hey, systems are going to be just right. They've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years, and they're going to set as many babies as possible because what does everything want to do? It all wants to live. It all wants to survive. Uh, and genetically encoded, which is very interesting, and this is my hypothesis with plants and everything else, is that they record things like an almanac, and they know that, and they send this information. Uh, plants do it with their seeds. Animals do it with their babies. Obviously, they, they have this sense, this like psychic ability to feel the uh, the weather. Uh, there was, I think, in India, there was somebody saying that you can tell when there's going to be like a monsoonal rain because these birds that usually make their nest on the embankment will do it to a certain feet above the river, right? They'll notice that they'll actually abandon their nest and start building a new one way up high. And just off that observation right there, they go, oh, shit, we're going to get a flood, right? So very important things to keep your eye on nature. Last thing I'm going to leave you guys here is what I did is I had an infestation for my seedlings. And this made it impossible to really grow a garden, right? Because you can't even start any seedlings. I direct sowed my plants. By the time the little baby came up, the aphids were already there. And they massacred probably like 70% of my garden this way. So, so what do we do? Same with this show, the philosophies I do with everything, with our money, with our earth, with our happiness, with our spirituality, with everything. We got we to gotta pivot and we got to invent and try to new things. So what I've proposed to do here, and I'm having success so far, is, uh, and I don't have time to go into soil blocks, how to make them, but I'm trying to eliminate the use of plastic. So I basically, to wet your whistle, will uh, uh, press, hard press this certain uh, uh, ingredients of soil into a block. There's no plastic, nothing whole, it's just a block, like a wooden block, but made out of soil. Um, I took my seedlings, I planted them in these blocks, and I built myself a steel rack enclosed with aluminum mesh screening. Uh, and I have a mister system that automates this whole thing for me. And I've, I can grow probably a, a couple thousand plants completely automated uh, and inside this little tiny uh, shelf. It gets some sunlight, it's all, it's all natural, I'm not doing anything with grow lights maybe yet. Uh, but I do, the only thing I artificially have to do is put a fan in there to circulate the air so that they get some exercise so they don't grow all leggy, meaning all skinny and tall. So I had to convert to that. So once the plants, the idea here, the philosophy is once they're established and they're large enough for me to actually grab their leaves and spray it with the soapy water uh, without crushing them or breaking their, their, their trunks, uh, that gives me a, bit, a little bit more of an advantage than just growing them in the ground where they're just, you know, a few inches tall and breaking them. So we'll take these plants, let them establish themselves, and then we'll introduce them to the garden uh, and maybe do some, some spraying as far like some maintenance spray as far as like peppermint oils, tomato, 
teas. We'll, 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 we'll continue to do things like that to keep the, uh, uh, basically keep the, the aphids away. And uh, hopefully the, um, this spring when I do plant, the uh, ladybugs will show up. Uh, and I forgot to mention on that too, if you build yourself a, a, a uh, biome, an area for these ladybugs that's favored, like a, uh, a, a large amount of bush and everything, they'll actually stay. They'll give birth to babies. Maybe the lacewings will as well, the, the uh, uh, praying mantises. They'll lay their eggs before their time's done, and those eggs will hatch. And the, why would they go anywhere? If you provide habitat and food and security for them, they're, they're not going to go away. The only time they'll ever move is if they get hungry, they get threatened, and they have no place to stay. You know, it's really quite simple. So think, I'm going to leave you guys with this. Think of the insects as well so that you can incorporate them into your, your garden and get that whole ball rolling here in a symbiotic relationship. You become a part of nature. You become part of your food and, and part of the predatory system of, of the balance of the equilibrium of life on earth and peace. And I believe this is the, the working like this together is going to open a lot of people up to their to good spirituality, good energy. It's going to make you feel good. The food's going to taste fabulous. And your attitude is going to be a lot better too because you're not spraying harmful chemicals and things like that. And you're actually working with the uh, with nature. And in fact, you could be fucking lazy, right? Why the fuck should I get up and do all the hard work? I got my ladies over here. You know what I mean? You're a pimp at that point. You're just sitting there drinking a beer. And, hey, Guys, a little over to the right, a little over to the left, you know, take care of that aphid problem for me, all right? I didn't build this whole habitat here for you for nothing, all right? You owe me. You owe me, ho. You know, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, they'll do the work for you, so you have, there's that, that one less thing that you got to do, right? How hard is it to let some weeds grow up or build some habitat for them? So hopefully this gave you guys some uh, joy, some laughs, and some entertainment, and hopefully you guys would consider, I'd love for you guys to let me know what you think about this. You guys support the show. I think I could do more uh, uh, shows like this where I can take more time and put more research into this and organize it a lot better instead of trying to cram everything into 15 minutes. So, and I mean, I think that this could be some life-changing stuff for people. I think this could really change, uh, like I said, from your money to your, to your gardening to everything. I think this could really help people out. And if you think it's worth $5 a month or $50 a year, please comment up and in it show at gmail.com. Let me know. I know that a lot of people are still going to want it free. And don't worry, as I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to give the free, but I can only afford to do it at 15-minute intervals. And we may go back to just three days a week. This is also another experiment where I'm trying to do five days a week right now. Um, so guys, that's the show. Let me know if I brought you guys any value. Uh, if you like this sort of thing, check it out up and in it on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. And also anywhere like Apple iTunes where they'll let me post this kind of shit. Uh, and as I always say, guys, go out there and have yourself a near-life experience. Don't lose your muchness. Carry on the fire. Human up. Live it. Love it. Own it.